Okay. All right. So uh, again, introductions. My name is Chris Brightwell. I'm a accidental house scouting historian. Um, I'm not black, but I thought this was an important history and I thought it should be shared. And when I learned about segregated scout camps many years ago from Dr. Flat, because he mentioned to me that there were a few and that we didn't really know much about them. Um, it's always kind of been curious to me that we don't really know anything about them, at least at least uh, in the circles that I'm in, we don't really know anything about them. And so when we started doing this Lodge history program, one of the things we really started digging into was some of the council camp histories. And I started to try to come up with some definitive answers on when these camps, the segregated camps opened and when they uh, closed or when the programs moved to the other camps. And so what I'm presenting tonight is kind of a, all of my notes with citations, basically. Uh, this topic can involve a lot of sensitive language. And again, because I'm not black, I'm liable to screw something up. So if I say something that's inappropriate or hurtful, somebody please correct me. This is a work in progress. Uh, it is obviously incomplete and some of it may be incorrect because newspapers aren't always 100% reliable. Um, but I have tried to avoid drawing conclusions from incomplete information. So you're going to see a lot of of things where I say it appears that this happened or or newspapers reported that something else happened. So I've tried to I've tried to be honest with what we know and what we what we don't know and I've tried to not speculate. Uh, special thanks to Greg and Larry for Greg provided all of the images of the memorabilia that we're going to see tonight. What what little bit we have. Larry helped me nail down some of the Camp Drake details and he helped me identify the location of Camp Nawaka and he's helped me identify some other stuff. And there are some other people as well, Dr. Flat. Um, I know Seth Hill helped Larry figure out a lot of stuff that, that Larry knew. So uh, this has been a kind of a collaborative effort, but I, I've been putting this together for a while. So when we start talking about segregated camps, there are a lot of people who are surprised that segregated scouting was even a thing. And so I wanted to provide a brief introduction to some segregated scouting facts. Uh, the first black scout troop is believed to have been founded on July 31st, 1911 in Elizabeth City, North Carolina. If you go read, there's a Boys Life article or something on, or it might've been a scouting magazine article. It's hard to really nail down exactly when the first troop was founded because the lot of them were unofficial. Sorry, somebody asking a question. Okay. Uh, but the general consensus seems to be the first one was, was in Elizabeth City, North Carolina. The first official troop, which would have been an officially chartered, officially registered unit with the BSA, appears to have been Troop 75 in Louisville, Kentucky. So by 1926, there were 248 all-black troops with 4,900 black scouts. And within 10 years, there was only one council in the entire South that refused to accept any black troops. Uh, during this time, as more troops started up, the interracial committee was established. That's a national committee. The interracial committee was established in January 1927 with Stanley Harris as its leader. And if you spend any time in the South Carolina area, you'll see a lot of historical workers. And there's, I think there's a camp, Stanley Harris, there. Uh, also, as part of the BSA, the Interracial Service was a program outreach, and it was designed to the combined. It was a program that combined outreach to racial minorities with rural, poor, and handicapped scouts as well. Hello. Hello. I'm just gonna mute people here. All right. Um. And then after the Civil Rights Act, I'm sorry, in the South with separate but equal mindset of the times, black troops were not always treated equally. They were often not allowed to wear uniforms. They often had smaller budgets and they offer had, they often weren't allowed to use the same facilities. And that included not only scout camps, but like YMCA's and, and, other, and other public spaces that they just weren't allowed equal access to. Um, and then after the Civil Rights Act, was passed in 1964, troops slowly began to integrate throughout the nation, even in the South, but there are currently several troops around the country that still remain all black. Some examples of segregated scout camps. Um, 
there's a little bit of a misconception as you start to talk about this that they only existed in the south but you can see this is just a a small snapshot of some of the camps that existed uh, you can see they're kind of spread all across uh, at least the eastern part of the country so they weren't only in the south and then if you wanted to do some reading i can i'll share these slides with anybody who wants them you can email me my email address will be at the very end of tonight's presentation um, but if you just start googling segregated boy scouts or segregated scout camps or segregated scouting you'll probably find these links and several others very quickly so locally the one that i know best and the one that it's probably the easiest to research just due to newspaper coverage and things like that is Camp Drake, which served the Tennessee Valley Council. Uh, these are a couple of the patches from Camp Drake. And then on the right, you can see there's a t-shirt from Camp Drake. The t-shirt would have been an early registration um, incentive. And you'll see some newspaper articles later that are going to kind of mention the free t-shirt for the early registration. I don't know if any other memorabilia exists, but we, if, if it does, I could not find a picture of it in, in the stuff that we have. Greg, do you know if there's any other memorabilia? Uh, well, I'm aware of are the uh, patches and t-shirts. So outside of what's pictured here, there's not anything else? Yeah, yeah there's, okay. a, there's a staff, there's a staff t-shirt that's uh, popped up recently. Is it the same design? It just says staff? Yes. Okay. So the location for Camp Drake, uh, it's this, it's the one down here on the map. It's just south of Rogersville, between Florence and Huntsville, right on the Tennessee River. And then if you zoom in on that, you'll see it's, it was part of what is today known as Joe Wheeler State Park. And it was based in this little, uh, I don't know what you would call this, inlet, this little peninsula type space right here. And we actually have a map from Camp Drake and you can see this little, uh, this little cove that cuts in right here, lines up perfectly with this little cove right here. So that's where the camp was. Uh, and so there were no, I can't find any articles from 1941. That's not to say that they don't exist, just that I can't find them. But we do find a couple of articles in 1942 that indicate that 1941 was the first year that they had camp and that it was held at a temporary location. So this wasn't the, the original location, but this was the location that they settled on very quickly. Um, at least the reporting in Huntsville at the time believed it was the first the first black scout camp in North Alabama. We don't know if, if that's exactly true, but that's what was reported. Um, and it was it was named in honor of uh, Dr. J.F. Drake, who was the president of Alabama A&M at the time and had been the president for a while. And he was brought to Huntsville to kind of uh, rescue Alabama A&M. And we'll talk a little bit later about how that went. Um, so on this side, you can see here's another article. There's just going to be a lot of newspaper articles that kind of snapshot some of some of what had happened in the camp, but it also does a really good job of picking out names. So uh, the campsite was located on the farm of Dr. Newman Sykes near Hillsboro. I haven't found that location yet, but I've been looking for it. And in the second summer, 10 troops participated. Um, in the camp. So it was directed by Taylor Williams, who is who is a name that I don't know very well yet, but you'll see that there was a different director very soon thereafter. So we move on to uh, 1940. Oh, here's another in 1942. Here's a, an editorial from uh, the Weekly Review, which I believe was a black newspaper out of either Huntsville or Birmingham, I'm not sure. But it just talks about Camp Drake and how great Camp Drake is for young black people and, and how it is going to help them become better men and better citizens. So 1943, camp operated for a week. Reported attendance was 130 scouts, representing 23 out of the 28 troops. So uh, 
Here we go. And here's the here's the citation. Camp Drake, which is located near Rogersville, ran for a week. So that was from the Florence Herald in 1943. 1944, you see David Kelly. David Kelly shows up as the program director, and then David Kelly will be the program director for like the next 20 years. And he becomes uh, the field director for the, the Black Division of the Tennessee Valley Council, and he becomes a very prominent character in uh, Black Scouting and, and the Tennessee Valley Council. Um, so there is a reference here to a to a 25 acre Jackson camp. I haven't figured out if that's Camp Jackson, but you can see here the conversation is there's Camp Westmoreland, Camp Drake, Camp Jackson. Uh, 25 chartered troops went on long-term camps. There we go, 160. 160 scouts attended Camp Drake that summer. So 1945, surprisingly, there's no reference that I can find in the newspapers that are available on newspapers.com to Camp Drake in 1945. We go to 1946, and you can see now they've moved to a new location. This is where they moved to that place that became Joe Wheeler State Park. Uh, the council established a finance committee to help develop the new property because they, when they when they got it, it was just uh, a piece of piece of land that had some trees and some some open fields and not much else. But as soon as they got the property or access to the property, they started trying to develop it. And this talks about uh, authorization to have a six day camping period instead of a seven day period was given, so that would let them check in on Sunday and then leave on Saturday and be home in time for church. Uh, religious service was held each Sunday at camp for the arriving scouts and for the staff. Uh, some new advancement procedures that were adopted. So 1946, we're at a new location. 1947, construction begins. Uh, and so they start working on here it is in May of 1947. You can see they start working on permanent buildings. So they're looking for uh, things like uh, include the dining hall, a large assembly room. They're building a new water system so they could have running water in the camp. Uh, it takes a while to get the water running, but they do eventually get the water running. You can see again, David Kelly is the field director and he's going to serve as camp director. Uh, you can see there was this talks about when the camp opened. And then over here is a is an article, the Alabama A&M College, uh, the B team, played a bunch of Decatur high school football players, but they did it at a football stadium in Huntsville, and they sold tickets to help raise money to develop the camp. So that was how they, that was one of the ways they were able to raise money to help build the camp. 1947, you also see the Dr. Drake receives the Silver Beaver Award. Uh, it was based primarily on his service to scouting in general, but especially in his service to black scouting. And it was also a recognition of the work that he did at Alabama A&M. And we haven't verified this, but we believe that he may be the first black scouter to receive, uh, in the South anyway, to receive the Silver Beaver Award. So here's a couple of pictures of Dr. Drake and then, sorry. And then uh, the, a newspaper article talking about who was present and and kind of the 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 order of events for the ceremony. So Dr. Drake receives it in 1947. 1948, you start to see non-scouting community groups use Camp Drake. You start to see 4-H clubs. You start to see church groups. You start to see other youth programs. You start to see other. Um, I think the Girl Scouts eventually come out. To, the, the Girl Scouts eventually come out to Camp Drake and are using Camp Drake. Uh, so Camp Drake starts as a as a Black Boy Scout camp, but it eventually it eventually grows into this outdoor resource available to Black Black youth groups across the Tennessee Valley. Total of fifty Scouts attended a two week session of camp that week or that year. 1949, camp is scheduled to run for two weeks, but I couldn't verify that it actually ran for two weeks. Um, but here's here's an article uh, talking about how many people they expected to attend. 
uh, how many people might have attended the year before. They talk about how this is the only the only camp in North Alabama where Black Scouts have an opportunity to learn how to swim. One of the things you'll find as we do this is that uh, water safety and swimming skills become a very prominent program feature in these camps. 1950, we couldn't find any articles. 1951, camp opens August 12th with a new electric lighting and they got the water running. So now they've got electric lights in the dining hall, they've got electric lights kind of strung throughout camp, and they've got running water. So they're continuing to develop the property and it's continuing to be more and more useful to the people who are using it and more and more inviting to people who might not be used to uh, roughing it. Great, Chris. Yeah. Hey, I've, I've got some uh, late 1940s council banquet programs that talks about construction of the dining hall and capital money being used for that. Okay. I think I've seen those, but I don't think we've scanned those. So we'll have to get those, we'll have to get those in the scanner. 1951, we see another uh, black scouter receiving the silver beaver from the Tennessee Valley Council. Uh, is this, I believe this is Dr. Leslie. He's, he uh, served as the camp medic, among other things. I could be, there's another silver beaver down here. I may be mistaken, but this is another example of, of a black scouter receiving a silver beaver. Uh, and in part because of the work that was happening at Camp Drake. He was on staff for several years at Camp Drake. 1952, camp ran again for two weeks, starting in August, uh, and again with David Kelly serving as the camp director. And these are just some some uh, snippets that we that we found from July and August leading up to camp. So you can see, uh, here's a, an article from the Huntsville Times where 11 scouts from Troop 100 in Madison were the first to register for camp. And here's where you see Camp Drake t-shirts were presented to the registrants by their scoutmaster, David Kelly Jr. Uh, as a, as a, as a incentive for signing up for camp. And you can see here, there's a citation where they've, they've invested now $4,800 at Camp Drake uh, in 1952, which is pretty significant for 1952. 1953, plans are underway for new development at the waterfront. Camp opens on August 9th and runs for two weeks. Uh, so here, yeah, here's an article that just mentions plans at the waterfront development. There's another, there's another couple of articles that talk about, they actually had, they, they were talking about doing waterfront development and then they had the meeting where they were gonna talk about it and then they had a plan where they were gonna actually do something. But waterfront development becomes a very prominent thing in 1953. Yeah, you can see again here they're talking. We have running water and lights, and the waterfront is in the making. So, camp is camp is really starting to come together by 1953. You also find in 1953 a scout named Billy Gray Williams, who was uh, a scout who was on staff. He was a lifeguard at Camp Drake. He was a life scout at the time, but he went to the National Scout Jamboree, uh, and then came back and they were and and this article was in the Huntsville Mirror which was a black newspaper from Huntsville talking about his experience at the Jamboree and some of his accomplishments in scouting you can see he's a senior patrol leader for troop 187 he's a den chief for two different packs uh, he served as a lifeguard for two years at Camp Drake he ran the programs during uh, scout week each year in February he helped the Girl Scouts at their camp uh, but he also serves yeah, 10th grade class at his high school, uh, serving as vice president. He would eventually, I think, become the president of a senior class. There's another article, maybe another article a few pages later, but I did find an article where it talked about how he became the class president. So uh, yeah, this is another one of these, one of these, one of these stories that is kind of out there from Camp Drake to, to kind of add some flavor to all of the facts and the figures.
1954, camp opens and runs for a week with approximately 50 scouts. And by this point, the research on Camp Drake gets kind of difficult because there's another Camp Drake that it shows up as a military camp in Japan. So if you start doing research on Camp Drake, you have to learn how to filter that out. But it says camp visiting day, so they welcome visitors on Wednesday and Friday to visit the camp. Uh, I'm not sure what year that started, but that would become a regular kind of a traditional Wednesday and Friday night or visitation nights at camp. 1955, camp opens for a week on August 14th. David Kelly Jr. Uh, is now the camp, he's again the camp director. He'll be assisted by W.H. Lewis, program director. So he's, there's a lot of, of the same faces are running camp from year to year. Swimming, canoeing, archery, nature study, first aid, outdoor cooking, handicrafts. 1955, George McKellop receives the Silver Beaver Award. George was the medic at camp, and he served as the medic for several years. And, and he's another one of these names that when you do the research, uh, appears several years in a row. So here's another Silver Beaver from the Tennessee Valley Council. 1956, camp opens. It was opening in August. Now it's opening in July. I don't really know why it made that shift, but here's the shift that it made. And I, and once it moves to July, it kind of stays in July. 1956. This talks about uh, the opening ceremony that they had at camp. Was sponsored by the Parents Aid Club of Troop Number 145 in Florence. The motto was Love, Service, and Sacrifice. And Dr. Drake uh, visited camp to serve as the master ceremonies for the opening ceremony. 1957, again, we're back in July. Swimming becomes a major program feature. By this point, the waterfront development is probably done. So they're doing, uh, at, at one point, and I'm not sure if it was this year or not, but at one point they start doing two swim lessons a day for most scouts. 1958, camp opens in uh, mid-July and runs for a week. There's a story about uh, a den mother and uh, a pack committee member who visited camp and then stayed overnight and then returned home. 1959, Camp Drake is open in July, and now it's open for two weeks. So it seems like attendance might have dipped a little bit, and then it starts to grow, so they add the second week back in. Uh, aquatic swimming, life-saving rowing, and canoeing will be part of the camp program. So again, they're kind of expanding the waterfront program. They're kind of leaning really heavily on the fact that they're on the river. 1960, Presumably, this would have been a black patrol of explorers. Um, and so there's an article that talks a little bit about the, the group getting ready to go to the Jamboree and some of the things they can expect to see at the Jamboree. Uh, or I'm sorry, this is when they came back. There's another article about before they left, but this was when they came back and some of the things they experienced at the Jamboree. 1961, camp was scheduled to open on July 9th, but I couldn't find anything after July that indicated that it actually opened, but all indications are that the camp actually opened and ran for two weeks in July. 1962, we're up now to 160 scouts and leaders attending Camp Drake. So 1962 was kind of a big year. It might have been the biggest year at Camp Drake. Um, and I believe they only ran for two weeks, but it was camp was at capacity. 
or over capacity. So that would have been a great summer to be there, I guess. In 1963, we see operations move from Camp Drake to Camp Westmoreland. I'm a, I would assume that it's because they had overflowed their capacity, they moved to Camp Westmoreland because Camp Westmoreland had more room to kind of spread out. But they ran a, a a black week at camp is how they did it. So they ran the normal, they ran the, the camp for the white kids and then they took a break and then they ran a week for the, the black kids. And then so by 1964, um, newspaper articles for Camp Drake become virtually impossible to find through online resources. Part of that is because after 1964, the Huntsville newspapers get really sporadic in their digital coverage. So uh, there may be stuff on microfilm and microfiche, but I haven't, I haven't gone through all of that. We believe the camp was used for some period of time to support unit camping and community programs because the community was using the camp. And, and I don't know when they stopped using the camp for uh, community use and for troop camping, but my understanding is that once they moved to Westmoreland in 1963, they stopped doing summer camp at Camp Drake. And today, of course, the property is part of Joe Wheeler State Park. Just a couple of notes on David Kelly. Um, I couldn't find it. I thought I had a picture of David Kelly, but I couldn't find it. He was the field executive, or he's the, the division field executive for the Tennessee Valley Council from 1943 to 1970, which would have covered, uh, I believe, the whole council. We had several divisions in the council, but I believe that he was the senior field executive for all of the divisions. We believe he was the first um, black member of the Order of the Arrow, at least in North Alabama. Or he, it, he was the black, he was not the first black member of the Order of the Arrow. We believe he was the first black member of the Order of the Arrow for North Alabama. As far as we know, he was the bl first black scout leader to attend the Philmont Training Center. And again, he served at Camp Drake for 20 years as camp director. Here's a photo of Troop 192. Troop 90, 192 was pretty prolific in terms of uh, scouting accomplishments and achievements. And this photo you can see over here on the left is Dr. Drake. This photo, if I understand correctly, was taken the day that Dr. Drake received his silver beaver. Uh, so uh, this is Dr. Drake. And over here, I believe this is uh, Mr. McKellop. He was the scoutmaster for the troop. And then in the top left corner right here is a scout that Larry Faulkner identified as the first Black Eagle Scout in our council. And that would have been in 1947. And then also, if you do some Order of the Arrow history in Cascanampo Lodge, uh, keep an eye out for Cherokee Chapter. You might see that if, if you're familiar with the history of the lodge today, you might see a Cherokee Chapter and not think much of it because we currently have a Cherokee Chapter. But back then, this was the chapter that served the segregated units across the entire council. And there's a few places where you can find printed rosters. And it's also the only chapter by its nature where you see members of that chapter spread out across the whole council. So if you're looking at Achinachi Lodge or Cherokee Lodge and you see a roster for a chapter and, and the addresses on that roster are spread out across the whole council, you're probably looking at one of these, uh, one of these chapters that was kind of segregated to serve the Black Scouts at the Black Camps. And again, just to be clear, this is not related to the modern Cherokee chapter, which is located in Birmingham and named to recognize Cherokee 50. Uh, and then here's a, I don't, re I don't remember the date on this newsletter. It wasn't dated. Um, but this talks about a meeting that they had at the scout office. They talked about election procedures. Um, and then the, the chapter was getting ready to have a camp out at Camp Drake in February. So, or uh, it says Fe February 26th and 27th of March. So I don't know if it was February or March, but it looks like they're getting ready to go do a cold weather camp out at Camp Drake. So that's, that's kind of the history, the annotated history of Camp Drake. One of the things we don't have 
and I wish we did was a better, more pictures. I don't, I don't have any pictures that I know of from Camp Trick. Um, but if we had more pictures or if we had more like biographical text, we could help fill in some of the stories that happened at Camp Trick. But right now, a lot of what we have are the facts and the figures. So moving on to Camp Nawaka, check the chat here. Yep. So moving on to Camp Nawaka, uh, that's the Birmingham Council Camp. I don't know as much about Camp Nawaka, and Camp Nawaka is not as well covered in the newspapers. That's one of the interesting things about Camp Drake and some of the other camps in the Tennessee Valley Council is they were they were covered really well in the local newspapers. Camp Nawaka and especially the camps in um, the Florence and Fort Payne area, they weren't covered quite as well. So it's harder to do research on them um, from home. You got to spend more time in the library and in the archives. So here's a couple of patches from Camp Nawaka. I believe these are the only two that we know of. And Greg, I don't know, are there any other t-shirts or neckerchiefs or anything that we've seen? There's there's a punch pattern for a third patch, but we don't, don't believe that patch was ever made. All right. So 1950, the first session was held in uh, late July. So this talks about there's a, they delayed the dedication because they wanted to wait until the camp was more developed, but they did go ahead and have camp in that first summer. And this talks about some of the leaders, uh, some of them graduated National Leader Training School. Uh, and these are some of the, just some of the staff who led the camp. Uh, there were 56 boys in attendance and an even larger group was expected for the second period. 1951, it ran again for two sessions. Uh, the first one on June 24th and the second one on July 1. And again, here you see scouts will participate in swimming and boating. That was a, that was a major selling point for getting these guys to camp was, was access to the water and access to the waterfront. 1952, uh, summer camp continued. At this point, it was also being used for unit camping and camperees. And you see a lot of articles about uh, units would, it's just like two lines in the newspaper, you know, troop, troop, uh, whatever would go to Camp Nawaka for the weekend or troop and whatever just got back from Camp Nawaka for the weekend or there was a camperee at Camp Nawaka. So it started as a summer camp property, but they very quickly started to use it for more frequent camping and more frequent uh, outdoor activities. This is a flyer. This is in my stash of paper somewhere, and I could not find it to get a better scan of it, but this is a photograph I took when I first found it um, from the Black Warrior Council talking about how the, 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 the Tuscaloosa Council was getting ready to send some of its boys to the Birmingham camp. So th this is one of the flyers that we have that was promoting camp and outlining, you can see that four periods of camp that summer. Uh, I think the fees here, yeah, the council bus, no, the cost is $10 per week to go to camp. Chris, this is actually in a scrapbook in um, a Black Warrior Council collection. I have I have a copy of this somewhere. I just don't know where it is. It may have been in something that James Flack gave me. I'm not sure. All right. So 1955 at Camp Nawaka camp continues. The pool is completed. Now, we say swimming pool today. We think you know a nice pool with pristine water. Those of you who've been to Camp Westmoreland and have seen the swimming pool there, you know that sometimes it's just a dam in the creek and it was just a place where they could collect deep water to swim in. So it says the swimming pool was completed. I don't know exactly what that means, but it was designed to improve the swimming experience at Camp Nawaka. Here's a photograph. It's not great because it's a, it's a lousy scan of an old newspaper. But this is some scouts and some leaders uh, in the dining hall at Camp Nawaka in 1956 from the Huntsville Mirror. 
1957, uh, you can see Troop 198 just completed a week of camping at Nawaka. Uh, swimming twice daily and other scout activities were participated in. 1959, and again, the Birmingham newspapers just didn't cover the camp as well, so it's a lot more sporadic. There's a lot less detail in some of these articles. Um, 1959, the third annual division championship swimming meet was held on Sunday. Uh, July 19th, July 30th, I think was a Friday. I'd have to go back and look at the calendar, but I think July 30th was a Friday. So a couple of days later, they had uh, the the Council Division Championship swim meet at two o'clock at Camp Nawaka. So I guess the swimming there was pretty good. 1962 in the Huntsville newspaper. Now you're seeing reference to uh, Girl Scouts renting the camp because they lost access to the camp that they're the to the the city parks that they had been using for a long time. 1963. There's a show and do at Camp Nawaka, which is kind of like a a scout expo. So 44 scouts attended the show and do and participate in activities that make up the daily program for summer camp. So uh, it says here again, camp will open on June 9th and run for four weeks. And also registration date for Girl Scouts was set. So they would run for four weeks, presumably uh, you know, if it opens in June 9th and runs for four weeks, by the time the girls get there on July 14th, you're talking about a separate separate set of weeks. So camp stayed busy for most of the summer. The registration fee for the girls now is $15. I don't know what it was for the boys, but. Oh, and then $25 for insurance and board. So. There's another photo of uh, Troop 249 uh, eating lunch in the dining hall, 1964, from the Mobile newspaper, which I thought was, I think this troop was from Mobile and they traveled up to Birmingham to go to camp. Uh, another news article, just briefly, it says Camp Nawaka is open for camp, uh, June 11 through 17, 18 through 24. Uh, and then June 25th through July 1. So there's three season, three weeks now of summer camp for, for the Boy Scouts. And then 1969 from the Alabama Journal. Here's a photo of some of the Girl Scouts who were at camp. Yeah, Chris. Yeah. Leroy Simmons, Troop 495. Hi. I camped at uh, Camp Nawaka either 1965 or 1966. Yeah. I remember huts. Uh, that we camped in. Uh, you say huts? Are you talking like, like military patrol tents, or are you talking like, 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 like a like a hut, like 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 some of the uh things we have at Camp Coma? Oh, okay. Uh, J. Arthur J Jordan, uh, recruited me to be a scout leader. He was the scout executive at the time, but his son, J. Arthur Jr., was one of the first Black Eagle Scouts. Well, he was the first Black Eagle Scout that I knew uh, uh, when I was in scouting uh, at the at the Bethlehem house. And I, I'm going to say it was 1965 or 1966 when we went to camp in the Walker for, for a week. Mm -hmm. But uh, in, in fact, for a long time, Jordan was the only Black Eagle Scout that I knew personally in Birmingham, mm -hmm. and that was a that was a Scout executive son. So I guess he had access to uh, earn mirror badges and advanced that uh, that the regular Scouts didn't have. And my father was a distributor for the Birmingham World newspaper, which was a Black newspaper in Birmingham. In fact, it was the oldest continuous running black newspaper in Birmingham for 60 years. And I want to say they went out of business in 1968 or 69, but they had an article weekly about blacks, about blacks and scouting. And I don't see anything. And I don't know whether they archived or whether it's on microfilm or 
well, everything historically is gone. But the Birmingham World, the Birmingham Times is the black newspaper right now. Mm -hmm. But the Birmingham World, my father was one of the distributors for the Birmingham World. And that was an article weekly in the Birmingham World about black scouting in Birmingham. Okay. If you, if you can, you know, I don't know if, if in it, uh, and, and the Birmingham World ran from, shoot, from the 1920s all the way through the, through the 60s to at least 68 or 60. Emory Jackson was the owner, founder, and the publisher of uh, the Birmingham World. But, uh, but I know they had a regular article in there about black scouting in Birmingham, probably because the, the, the Birmingham Times, I mean, the Birmingham post Herald and the Birmingham News uh, very seldom uh, printed anything about, about scouting, uh, about black scouting in, in Birmingham. Right. But there were a lot of articles in the Birmingham world. You know, I kind of suspected that there was a black paper that just wasn't in this archive that I have access to. So uh, I wrote, I tried to write all of that down. <laughs> And I will I will do some more research and see if I can find. Uh, my wife is a librarian, so I'll I'll get her to see if she can help me find copies of those and start Chris, digging through those. Chris, let me share my screen, and I think I've got a picture of what he's talking about. Uh, multiple nope, all participants. All right, you should be able to share it, Greg. That's that's from Camp Milwaukee. Yeah, I, I I remember we didn't sleep in tents, and uh, that's similar to the bunks we have, the old bunks at, at Camp Coma right now. Mm -hmm. They still have a few of them left, but yeah, that's it. That's where we slept. And I must have been in the six, the fifth or sixth grade. I may have been in the sixth grade then. But that's the inside, yeah, that's the inside of our bunk. Cool. Okay, so the Birmingham world, I will, I will see what I can find. Well, the Birmingham world and the Birmingham Times, because James, um, Jesse Lewis, I think is a Silver Beaver recipient. So he's been a big time and he served on the board too, so. Uh, I used to have some contact with them, so between me and Leroy, I guess we can we can also research the the world in the times. Okay. But I only camped just that one that one week. That was the only year that I camped at uh, Nawaka was just mm -hmm. that one time. What was your? Sorry, what was your? Um, I guess your. What sticks out to you the most from your time at camp? Do you know? Do you remember? Uh, like... It was hot. <laughs> and, okay. we, you know, we, we played around in the water a lot. And I remember uh, when my bunk mate was from it because we were at the troop at the Bethlehem house, which is located in Smithfield, about three blocks down from Parker High School, where the bus used to leave going to uh, Camp Nawaka from Parker. So almost okay. everybody in my troop was in my neighborhood. Right. And we were, we were chartered at the Bethlehem house, which is uh, 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 the housing authority uh, for Smithfield projects right now. Okay. Then you just remember that it was hot. So you went swimming a lot. Right. Okay. Maybe that was why they, maybe that was why they talked about the waterfront so much is because it was just hot. Okay, cool. Well, thank you. Let's see. So 1969, Camp Nawaka, there were some Girl Scouts. There's a photo of some Girl Scouts who were at camp. 1970, uh, it says 500 youngsters to go to camp, but that's not 500 going to Camp Nawaka. Um, let's see, where is the reference here to Camp Nawaka? There it is. Uh, the youth will be integrated into regular activities at Nawaka, the Boy Scout camp in Blossom. Oh, this is Girl Scouts. 
So Camden Walker continued to be at use at least into 1970. And then uh, here's another photo of uh, Griffin Franklin Day receiving the Silver Beaver. His name shows up somewhere in the Camp Milwaukee stuff, but I couldn't figure out what he did at camp. He may have just been a, a prominent leader who contributed to some of the work that was happening at the camp. And then here's another, uh, it says 1943. I don't, one of these, I don't think that's right. I think it should say 1963. But here's another article talking about how he received a Silver Beaver. So that's Camp Nawaka, and that was in Birmingham. So Huntsville had one Black Scout camp. Birmingham had one Black Scout camp. When we started doing all of this research, we knew that Chakalaka Council had at least two. We knew about Camp Seedon, and we knew about Camp uh, Madison. And when I started trying to trace down where that transition from Camp Seedon to Camp Madison occurred, we found a third camp that was Camp Willett. And at the time, we thought that was it. So we'll start with Camp Seedon. Camp Seedon was located uh, where you can see here on the map, and we'll zoom in here a little bit. It was described in the Anison Star as three miles east of Pell City off of Highway 78. And so if you go to Google Maps and you kind of trace from the edge of Pell City, three miles out, you see this little, this little, uh, sorry. See this space right here, and and if you look at the if you look at the the maps and you look at some of the geography and the topography, this is the most likely case, most likely place where I think that camp would have been located, but we haven't been able to verify that. Uh, did I have a? Yeah, the location for Camp Nawaka came from Larry Faulkner, and he said he got that from. He said he had verified that somehow, but I haven't seen the verification on it. So uh, Camp Seedon, uh, three miles east of Pell City. This is the earliest article I could find on Camp Seedon. It's 1948. Um, more than 100 boys attended the August camp at Camp Seedon. So in 1948, that would have been pretty significant. 1949, camp continues at Camp Seedon. You can see the the Ladiga Ladiga district. That probably is the district that served all of the Black Scouts in the council, or or all the Black Scouts in a very large part of the council. Nineteen fifty, camp continues. There's a list of some of the troops that were attending the camp and where they would have been chartered, like which which churches or or other organizations would have chartered them. Some dates on when camp would have been held near Pell City. Uh, 1951, camp continues. And you also see now that, again, they're also using the camp for camp raids and other unit camping and things like that. And, you're, and you'll start to see other community groups using these camps as, as safe outdoor spaces. 1952, summer camp was canceled due to a polio outbreak uh, and at Camp Seedon, well, I don't know if the polio outbreak was at Camp Seedon. I should be clear. Camp Seedon was canceled due to a polio outbreak, but Nowaka and uh, Drake continued with camp. 1953, uh, camp returns to Camp Seedon, August 3rd through 8th. 1954, camp returns once again. Move my window here. And again, one of the things that the Aniston paper, they may have been sporadic in their coverage, but at least the Aniston Star, uh, whoever was submitting these articles to the newspaper was really good about including names and troops and things like that. So if you're looking for a specific name or a specific troop in the Aniston area, you may be able to find it. 1958, as far as I can tell from the online archives at newspapers.com, this is the last article I can find. Uh, and this is Robert Nunn, who was a, an Eagle Scout in the Chakalaka District, or Chakalaka Council. And this says he attended, uh, and this is where you start to see the transition 
Uh, he attended Camp Seedon and Camp Willett. And so this, if I remember, this is where I first got wind of Camp Willett. And I said, wait a minute, what is Camp Willett? And then we figured out that Camp Willett was the next place where uh, Black Scouts would have summer camp. And so we make the transition to Camp Willett. Camp Willett now is located on Pelham Range at what would have been Fort McClellan at the time and is now, I believe, still part of the Army, the Anniston Army Depot. You zoom in, you can see there's this little spring here called Willett Spring. And it was named for the family that lived there at the time. So uh, we knew that we knew that they made this transition in 1958 or 1959 to Camp Willett. But when I started doing some more research just recently into Camp Willett, because I was trying to find some verify, like some hard data on when camp first opened and when it first closed, because I wanted to be able to share that tonight. Camp Willett became more mysterious to me. So here's an article from 1921 that talks about, it's kind of hard to read, but it says, it says, say fellows, why don't you uh, get busy and persuade your scoutmaster of yours to take you for a weekend trip to Camp Willett? This is in 1921. Um, and this seems kind of strange to me. I wasn't sure if this was the same Camp Willett or if this was a different Camp Willett. It didn't seem to talk about black scouts at Camp Willett. It was just scouting, like just a general scouting outing to Camp Willett. And so now I'm really confused because I had previously seen some information that said the Camp Willett was where they had the segregated camp for several years before they moved to Camp Madison. And now I'm seeing articles in 1921. So this just made everything more confusing. It also, it also seems that uh, Camp Willett was regularly used by Girl Scouts in the 30s. And so there's a long history at Camp Willett that I'm just now starting to know about. Uh, Camp Willett needs a lot more research. And the, unfortunately, the Anderson papers are not super detailed. So I'm going to I'm gonna have to find a better way to do some research on Camp Willett. Um, this note, <laughs> since I wrote this note a couple of days ago, uh, I have figured out that it was not originally a segregated camp, but it was it was transitioned into a segregated camp later. So here's a newspaper article from 1960, which is very clear about Black Scouts went to Camp Willett, White Scouts went to Camp Sin. Uh, 1920, here's another article from 1927. Again, that just talks about generically Scouts going to Camp Willett. So there's a lot of uh, for me, initially, there was a lot of confusion. So it appears that Black Scouts moved their summer camp experience from Seedon to Willett in about 1957. This would be consistent with the sudden stop of information on Camp Seedon in local newspapers at about that time. There's still a lot to learn about Camp Willett, and I'm just now learning how much I don't know about Camp Willett. What's interesting, though, is that Camp Willett is one of the few places that has been visited kind of recently by scouts and so scouts participated in a service project there in 2011. Uh, and this was I don't know some of you have been around long enough you probably would recognize the name Ted Heathcock but this was something that he wrote up and submitted to the Anison Star in 2011 about a service project that his troop did at Camp Willett. Um, and one of the quotes out of this is that there's virtually nothing left of the old camp from the early 1900s, except for the spring and an open field. So, and then here's a photo from 1965 um, of Black Scouts and White Scouts together at Camp Willett. And then we start to, and then I start to think about this transition. I'm, I'm trying to find the date where they moved from Camp Willett to Camp Madison, because I know it happened in about 1960. And literally this morning, as I was trying to figure out where that transition happened, I found this article, uh, which raised several questions at the time. Uh, if you read the article, it talks about they're trying to find a new property to establish a new Black Scout camp permanently. 
And so the question is, well, did they ever find that property that they were looking for? And if you keep reading the, uh, if you keep reading, uh, if you keep reading, you figure out that that property was Camp Madison. They eventually found Camp Madison. But this also mentions that Camp Seaton was owned by Avondale Mills, which is, this is the first time I've heard that. Avondale Mills, of course, is important because Hugh Comer was, I don't know if he was the owner of Avondale Mills, but he was, he was a prominent leader at the mill. And Avondale played a significant role in the development of Camp Comer. And then the mill owned another camp down in Florida that uh, scouts would sometimes use when they traveled to Florida. So did Avondale Mills really own Camp Seaton? That's something I'm trying to figure out. And if so, was Comer involved? If so, how was he involved? And then we find this, this reference to a camp I had never heard of before. Uh, Black scouts were allowed to hold their camp on attractive land near Ohatchee, known as Camp Coosa, owned by the Coosa River News Print Company. And I thought, huh. So we've got a couple of, I've got a, a member of the history committee, lives in Ohatchee near the Coosa River, and he's like, man, I've never heard of this place. And sure enough, you do a little bit of searching in 1960, you can find a couple of articles that said uh, they attended Camp Coos on July 25th. It ran for two weeks. So here's another piece of, of history that we just never knew existed. And part of it is because they probably had no memorability. There were probably no patches. There were probably no t-shirts. There might be a few letters from camp and that's probably about it. Uh, so yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, backing up to Avondale Mills, uh, the mill had property in Florida for their employees to go take family vacations. So, um, yeah, but there's there's articles in the papers at the time that indicate that troops would also use that camp when they visited. Right. Yeah. But this is the first time I've seen any reference that anything that tied Avondale to Seaton. Yeah, I got and it. And so I was kind of, I was, this article really blew my mind at like seven o'clock this morning when I was trying to finish this, this presentation. Um, there were like three pieces of information in here that I didn't know until this morning. So this is still a work in progress for sure. So where was Camp Coosa? Camp Willett was down here, the number five on the map. Ohatchee, Alabama is right here. And if I, if I can read the map correctly, this squared off road that you see was kind of the perimeter road that went around the range. Uh, and so that would be the perimeter of the old Fort McClellan. Um, and so I'm guessing somewhere in these woods between that squared off road and the town of Ohatchee is where Camp Coosa was. But I have not figured I, I've, I've known about it for a day and I haven't figured out where it is yet, but I'm going to find out where it was one way or another. So they leave Camp Seaton. They'd spend one year at Camp Coosa. And then they moved to Camp Madison and Camp Madison is the first place where we find memorabilia. And again, this is courtesy of Greg and and some of his sleuthing. Uh, these are the only things I've seen. Greg, are there any T-shirts or anything that you're aware of? I haven't seen a t-shirt, just uh, just the neckerchief. And just the patch. neckerchief and the patch. Okay. So, Camp Madison was located just south of the the Fort McClellan at the time, and it was and and we don't have the exact location. The best I can find is located on Chocolaca Creek near Jennifer, and you can find a brief reference to some really rough driving directions and as best I can tell it puts it right about here on the map and I can if somebody's really interested I can give you some really rough GPS coordinates to kind of get you close but this is where we believe Camp Madison was located it's, uh, it's, still, it's still being used on today I think a church camp and there's district camperees uh, and someone shared a picture of like a gateway. See, and I, I've looked 
for any like on the map i was looking for evidence of it and i've been looking in what i have available to me i still don't know where it is so you may be right somebody locally may be able to tell me where it is but i don't know where it is hey chris yeah uh, there is a cub scout patch that's a lad dad weekend from camp matson mm -hmm. i had it but i let uh seth hill have it so i don't know who has it now yeah, there's they they did those for several years, but that's really not a uh, part of when it would have been a segregated camp. Those were oh okay, yeah, and we're sure were, we're sure it's the same property. Yes, yes, it's, okay. Uh, that was like from the late seventies into the eighties, maybe all the way up to ninety. There's about um, there's over ten years of those patches, and they're numbered. Um, you know what year. Mm -hmm. that that uh, event was being held. Okay. So somebody is still around who knows where it is, but I haven't been able to figure it out. So we'll figure that out. All right. So 1961, Chocolaca Council purchases 105-acre property for the establishment of a permanent campsite. I don't think we still own that property, so I'm curious to know who owns it now and kind of how it's being maintained. You say it's a church camp? I'm pretty, pretty sure it's church camp. Okay. Because when I typed Camp Madison into Google Maps, nothing came out. That was one of the things I suspected, but I haven't, like I said, I haven't been able to figure out. I haven't figured it out yet. Um, so they held a trial session at camp in 1961. And so this article talks about uh, the acquisition of the camp. Uh, some of the, some of the personalities involved. So, uh, C.M. Jesperson of Aniston uh, presided over, what is it? Hang on, I got to read this. Purchase of 105 acres for the establishment of permanent camping location was announced this week by the Chocolate Council Executive Committee with C.M. Jesperson of Aniston presiding. So, um, so, yeah, we have a new camp. 1962, Camp Reeser held in May and October. And then summer camp operated for three weeks. The final began on Monday, July 9th. This is just a couple of newspaper articles talking about uh, some of the activities that were happening at the camp. Camp dedication was held on September 3rd, 1962. Here's a photo of a scout lake. It, re it, it describes it as a six acre lake for Boy Scouts at Camp Madison in Talladega County. I have used Google Earth to try to measure a lake that is approximately six acres, and I have not found it. I've measured a lot that are three acres and a lot that are four acres, but I haven't found any that are in the, the area of roughly six acres. And I was trying, that was one of the ways I was trying to find the camp. So either I'm way off in my estimate, or the lake is not as big as it used to be. Nineteen sixty five. We can find a couple of photos from scouts at camp and scouts getting ready to go to camp. You see in December, December 20th, 1964, some adult scouters gathered at Madison uh, to inspect the dam and look at a possible site for a dining hall. They did eventually build the dining hall. And if you look at that dining hall, the construction looks pretty similar to the dining hall at Camp Comer, which I thought was interesting. And then here's another photo of some scouts at Camp Madison. Uh, camping and development continued through 1968. So this is an article that talks about the Chocolaca Council in general, but there is a reference in here somewhere to Camp Madison and some of the work that's happening at Camp Madison. 1969 and beyond, it continues to be used for unit camping and Camp Reese, but newspaper coverage becomes increasingly sparse. By 1981, council, and Greg, this is, this is why I asked the question. By 1981, the council reported that the property had become neglected and the buildings had been damaged. Uh, so I said, I, I don't know if anything remains of Camp Madison, but you're saying that probably as a church camp now? So I'd be curious to know if we can figure out where that is and figure out what's on the property. 
But this is the last reference I found to Kent Madison in any of the Aniston Star newspapers. So I'm wondering if it's operating under a different name and I just couldn't find it. So Kent Madison, still a work in progress. Uh, and some, just briefly, one other topic. This is something I found while I was exploring all of this, this information, but uh, it looks like the first black unit of air scouts in the Southeast came from uh, Mount Zion Baptist Church in Anniston. And, and this would have been a very prolific group of air scouts. They would have had several ACE award recipients and several, in terms of air scouts, these, these guys were pretty, uh, pretty fired up and were, were well respected across the region, at least the old region five as a pretty, pretty, pretty sharp group of air scouts. So this is one of those, this is one of those units that's kind of on my list of, I'd like to do some research and figure out what we can, what we can learn about that unit and start to pull some names and see if I can figure out the story there. But this is one of those stories that's kind of sitting there waiting for me to get to. So that's kind of where we are. So if you're, if you're listening to this and you're kind of curious about what we're doing and you're, and you're thinking, well, how can I help expand some of this? Like I said, we have a lot of facts, but we don't have much of a story. So Leroy gave us a great example of what I'm looking at what I'm talking about when I say I'm looking for the story. We could really use photos and letters and flyers, but we're looking for some of the things that make the experience at these camps more human and less just a list of facts. Because right now we have a, we have a great list of facts, but we're, I'd love to have more of the, the human story. So if you do nothing else, when you go to yard sales or estate sales or flea markets or antique shops or anything else, uh, I hope that at least now that you've seen these names, Camp Drake, Camp Nawaka, Camp Seedon, Camp Willett, Camp, Co Camp Coosa, which is a new one, Camp Madison. Uh, if you see anything with any of those names on it and it's a price you're willing to pay, I hope you'll grab it and share it with us. I don't necessarily need you to donate it to me physically. If we can digitize it and keep a copy of it in our digital archives, that would be amazing. Uh, some of you who are on the call who may have been to these camps as scouts, if you've got photos or letters or anything that you're willing to share and let us digitize, I would love to have a copy of it. So as, as brief as I could make it, <laughs> that was a, a brief tour of segregated scout camps in the modern greater Alabama council. So, uh, I will entertain any questions if anybody has any questions or if anybody has a story that they want to share or if anybody has any kind of thoughts on the topic, uh, I'd love to hear it. If you want to email me, you can send me an email. I'll send you a copy of these slides if you're interested. We'll also have a recording of this available in a couple of days. Uh, Greg says, let me share again. So make a note of my email address. We'll put it back up on the screen. The next one of these is going to be on March 9th. We don't currently have a presenter lined up. So if you've got a topic that you're interested in sharing, uh, we're looking for somebody to share something on March 9th. All right, Greg. Please. Yeah, I heard Please, my name. Uh, I, I just want to say uh, you did a great job. I mean, just, you know, I want to commend you on doing work on this. Um, this who, am I, who am I talking to here? Robert. This is Robert Young. Robert Young. Sorry, Robert. I couldn't see your name highlighted here in the list. So, Robert, well, cur Robert currently serves as the Scout Reach Director for the Central um, Area of Birmingham of um, the Council. Okay. And he's also a longtime member of um, and former charter representative for um, Troop 415, which is a historically back Black. Um, scout scout troop at um, Sixth Avenue Baptist Church in Birmingham, which has a long history of scouting, which still needs to be documented in more detail. Okay, well, Robert, uh, thank you for your kind words. I'm happy to do this. I really, I'm hoping that by me sharing this, I can kind of encourage others to 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 do some of the footwork and try to some of you guys that are in, in these troops that might have gone to these camps, maybe you've got scrapbooks stashed away somewhere that we can digitize. 
uh, I think that would be amazing. But we're going with what we got. My neighbor actually tells me about his time when he was at Camp Wakuma, um, down there in Best down in Birmingham camp. So he he knows about it. He doesn't have any photos or anything, but he's told me about you know the fun they had when they were there. Okay. Well, if if you think he would be interested in in talking into a microphone for a little while to share some of his stories, I'd we could do a you know a phone interview or or something and just try to record some of that stuff. Um, okay. Well, you've got my contact information, so you can either give him my email address or talk to him and and give me his phone number, and we'll we'll figure something out. We'll do that. Thank you, sir. All right, Greg Sweatman, what do you got? This looks like the patches from. <clears throat> yeah, that's um, that's the ones I've got from that event. So it went at least thirteen years, and the first one I have is number three in nineteen eighty three. So it started in nineteen eighty one. That's really interesting, because. Yeah, so here's an article in 1981 that said much of the camp had become overgrown. So I I wonder if that's like the 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 heart of the camp kind of survived, but a lot of the campsites and stuff became overgrown. I don't know. We got to figure this out. I got to figure this out. And I just sent you a, an email that's got an article that was in the Florence uh, Times Daily this past Sunday. Uh, about uh, black scouts that went to Camp Westmoreland in 1972. And they just had a reunion um, there at a church. Um, and some of us were discussing it this week because no one really knows who they are. And one of the gentlemen in there, he says he's 80 years old. He's a scout master. He's got mm -hmm. a picture. He's got his uniform on. And he's got a Greater Alabama Council shoulder strip on. But uh, Philip and Daniel are none of those guys from that area really know who they are. Hmm. So Philip, Philip is going to reach out uh, to the lady that wrote the article and okay. see if she can get contact information from them and uh, invite them to the campery that's coming up in a couple weeks over there. Yeah, I hate that I'm not going to be at that campery. I've got theater obligations with my son's theater program. But if you find out he's going to be there, let me know, and I, I'll try to get up and drive over for like the morning. But I'm, I think we have a two o'clock show time on Saturday. Cool. So what paper was this in? This was in, I don't see the paper, or the Times Daily. Is that the Florence? Yes, Times Daily. Okay. Cool. Well, all right. We're a little bit long. We usually try to wrap this up in an hour. We're at an hour and 15 minutes right now. <laughs> I do want to go around the room because we have some new faces. I would really love to at least go around the room and do some introductions and just kind of tell us who you are, uh, where you're from, and what you do in scouting. So uh, if you don't mind, we will go down the grid according to what's on my computer screen here, and we'll start with Mr. Young. Oh, okay. My name's Robert Young. As Deborah said earlier, I'm the I'm the Scout Beach Director for the Greater Alabama Council. Before that, um, I was a volunteer uh, at 14 Troop 415 and Pack 415 at 6th Avenue Baptist Church. And I did a short stint as a district commissioner um, when the Birmingham district was still around. So uh, that's me and uh, yeah, I believe in the program. I have a son who's an Eagle Scout. Also, have a daughter 
my wife and I also have a daughter who who's uh who received the gold award from Girl Scouts. So um we'll be taking some uh, we'll be taking as somebody mentioned earlier, we'll be taking a crowd to um film a bridge crossing uh on on the first on March fifth. That's that first Sunday in uh in March. And that's down in Selma? Yes, down in Selma. Thank you, Robert. Up next is Deborah Huff. How are you doing, Deborah? I'm doing good, Chris. Thank you very much for tonight. It's been a real eye opener, um, especially about Westmoreland. Just had no idea that there was a connection with um, Blacks and Scouting at that camp. So it's given me a whole new perspective on um, Westmoreland in that area. I'm Deborah Huff. I live in Birmingham, Alabama. I'm a CUSA Lodge member, and I'm currently serving as the co-chair of the National Arrowman Black Caucus, which is an affinity group that came out of the 2024 um, uh, NOAC and the DEI, the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion um, subcommittee, which is just trying to address the issue of making sure that everybody who wants to be included in scouting and the order of the arrow can can feel comfortable and um, will we'll continue to, to support the programs. So thank you for, for tonight. Yep. Thanks for joining us. Mm -hmm. Greg Sweatman, how are you? Good. Uh, I'm Greg Sweatman, um, charter org rep for back 275 and crew 310 in Priceville, which is uh, on the outskirts of Decatur. Um, involved mostly with the OA and uh, uh, this, enjoy this uh, history committee and uh, all the work that's being done around it and trying to present as, a, as a, we're I guess uh, asked to do in the obligation, observe and preserve the, tra the tradition. So enjoyed it. Thanks, Greg. Mike Thigpen, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Uh, Mike Thigpen from Gunnersville, Alabama. Uh, been active in Coosa Lodge and Chocolock Council before that. And uh, gosh, what can I say? It's a <laughs> That was a real eye opener for me, and I, I'm 77 years old. You know, I thank you, Chris. That's that's well done. Thanks, Mike. Leroy Simmons, how are you? Going well this afternoon, guys. Uh, Leroy Simmons, uh, Troop 495, Fairfield, Alabama. Uh, Longtime scoutmaster, 25 years to be exact. I have three sons, Eagle Scouts. My oldest son is in Charlotte, North Carolina. My young, middle son is the assistant scoutmaster for 2495. And my youngest son is a coach at Irondale. Uh, right now, I got 15 scouts. Uh, 12 of them will be going camping tomorrow for the Vulcan Campery at uh, Tannehill State Park. So we'll be there uh, till Sunday. Uh, which is uh, Sunday is my birthday, and uh, tomorrow is Deborah Huff's birthday. So this is a February thing. <laughs> <laughs> All I don't right. know if you want this group singing happy birthday or not, though. <laughs> no, my gift to you is that I will not sing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Simmons. Eric Ross, how are you? Hello. Uh, happy birthday, Leroy and Deborah. Thank you. My name is Eric Ross, uh, long history with the council, my, all the way back in the 60s with my family and uh, of three Eagle Scouts, a life scout. And uh, I served in OA with uh, Atunachi Chakalaka Council as lodge chief in 84, and then on through CUSA with a uh, trading post advisor after Mike Big Ben stepped down and things of that nature. Um, I currently serve on the Camping and Properties Committee for the Council. 
and uh, work with the history committee now. Uh, it's a great presentation, Chris. Uh, I do want to leave you with a question. During the presentation, I saw Camp Seaton spelled two different ways mm -hmm. and in an article a different way. So I just mm -hmm. want to research on correction of spelling there. I believe the correct spelling is S E D E N. That's but what news, I thought. Newspapers at the time were notorious for typos and, and misspellings. So they did not have autocorrect at the time. They didn't have spill check. <laughs> All right, thanks, Eric. Heather Reardon, how are you? You're on mute. There we I go. know. Just took me a minute. Hi, Chris. Hi. Um, Heather Reardon, I'm representing Arrowhead District. Um, we are, let's say, I have one in PAC 140 and one in Troop 142. Um, have been in Scouts for seven years now. and. I just find all the history of scouting very fascinating and the work you're putting into this, you're doing a great job. And thanks for letting me and for the invite to join in with you guys. Thanks for joining happy, us. Happy birthday to all the February birthdays. <laughs> right. Sorry you're not going to be at Camp Ari. Hopefully we'll see you there, if, even if it's for a few moments. Yeah, I'm hoping I can show up for a couple of hours, but we'll see. It's it it, like going to be a lot of foxes there. It wouldn't be the first time I've driven two hours to be there for 45 minutes and then drive home. <laughs> <laughs> so. Well, maybe we'll get to be there. We plan on being there. Awesome. All right, Charles Doshi, how are you? Oh, sorry about that. I was on mute. Uh, good evening. Yeah, this is uh, Charles Doshi. Uh, Chris, uh, again, uh, you did the great job on your uh, presentation and uh, a Thank lot you. of great information. Um, yeah, I'm the um, currently the cup master of Pack three three five one in in um, Huffman, um, and uh, Leroy. Yeah, my son and I met you and your boys at the um, Veterans Day. Um, I'm sorry, the uh, yeah the Veterans Day parade a couple months back. We took pictures with you guys, so good to see you again. Um, but yeah, um, like I said, I'm a cup master. I've been uh, cup master for out there with the boys for about uh, what, three or four years. And um, son, uh, he's the Weeble East Bridge. He crossed over to the uh, to the Boy Scout side now, um, coming up for next year. So looking forward to that as well. Cool. Thank you for joining us. John Kelton, how are you, sir? Good evening. How are y'all? Uh, this is John Kelton. I am. Um, I'm glad to see some folks here from Fairfield on the call tonight. I grew up in Pleasant Grove right next door and Eagled in Troop 120. Butch Thomas was my scoutmaster. And uh, I now live in Huntsville and serve as the chapter advisor for Cascano, Cascanapo chapter in Madison County. So thank you, Chris, for all your research. And, I, you know, it takes, you know, three hours of research for three seconds of fact. And, well, yeah, uh, th and this was a lot more than three hours, I'll tell you that. <laughs> so, good. Thanks, John. I'm glad you're here. Alan Camp, how are you? Uh, hi, Chris. Uh, doing well, thanks. I'm Alan Camp. I'm the uh, assistant scout, or an assistant scoutmaster from Troop 226 in Hoover, and also the Nunahi chapter advisor. Um, I really enjoyed the presentation tonight, and and I want to echo, yeah, I'm sure you put a ton of work into gathering all this information and presenting it in the timeline like you did. It was very informative. Thank you. Thank you. Janet Mayhall, how are you? Hello, I am well. Uh, Janet Mayhall from Boaz. My primary uh, jobs in scouting at this point are working with CUSA dance team dancers and uh, the Brotherhood Ceremony for CUSA. All right. Thank you, Jana. And Gary's iPad, it's gotta be Gary Kiker. How are you, Gary? I'm doing well, thank you. Chris, that was awesome. That really was. Um, I, I enjoyed it thoroughly. I'm, my name is Gary Kiker. I currently reside in Nashville. 
Um, I'm a member of the Coosa Lodge and I'm serving where I can in that, in the lodge. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. And then uh, if my, if my records here are correct, last but not least would be Shanika Lawson. Hi, yes, I um, am a member of um, PAC 3351 as the committee chair. Hi, Doshi, my cup master. <laughs> and I'm a member of the Kusa Lodge. And I serve the Three Rivers District as a membership vice chair. And I am a current troop guide with the current Woodbash course that ends in October. And thank you for the research. You know, as a Black scouter, just don't, didn't really know the history within the council. So it was very encouraging. And happy birthday, Miss Deborah, early. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you for and joining us. <laughs> uh, did I miss anybody? I think we got everybody. All right. Once again, my name is Chris Brightwell. Uh, I've been doing scouting for 30 years now, and I am a part of the history committee, among other things. So thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, let me put this slide back up on the screen here. Uh, our next presentation will be... March 9th. We don't know what the topic will be yet, but it'll be Thursday night, March 9th at 8 o'clock. It'll be on Zoom. The same link should work. And if you have any questions or anything you want to share or anything you want to present to the group, you see my email address. It's chris at dimwell.net. And with that, we are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Good night.